There are only two hard things in computer science, cache and validation and naming things. This famous quote has survived decades for a reason. We spend more time reading code than writing it, and names are the first thing we read. A bad name forces you to stop, trace definitions, hold context in your head. A good name disappears. It tells you exactly what something does without making you think. Yet, most developers treat naming as an afterthought. Today, we're fixing that. Seven naming patterns that silently sabotage your code, and exactly how to fix each one. These aren't style preferences. They're patterns that have burned countless hours in debugging sessions and code reviews. By the end, you'll spot these anti-patterns instantly and write names that make your code read like well-written prose. Tip one, don't use single letter variable names. Look at this equation on screen. Y equals MX plus B, classic algebra. In math, this is elegant because equations are meant to be read, not edited. But now look what happens when we turn it into code. Suddenly, those single letters become a problem. Code gets modified, extended, debugged at 3 in the morning when you've forgotten what X meant. Single letters force the next developer to trace backwards through your code, building a mental map that should have been obvious from the name itself. The exception is loop counters. Using I, J, K in a simple for loop is universally understood. But the moment your loop body grows beyond a few lines, even that convention breaks down. The cost of typing a longer name is measured in seconds. The cost of deciphering cryptic variables is measured in hours. Make the trade. Tip two, never abbreviate names. Here's a function on screen called rel score. Quick question, does that mean relevance score, relationship score, or relative score? You don't know, and that's exactly the problem. Abbreviations seem like a clever shortcut when you write them, but six months later, the context is gone. Abbreviations only work when everyone shares the same mental dictionary. And in code bases with multiple developers, or even just future you, that dictionary evaporates. The old excuses are dead. Typing speed? Autocomplete finishes long names in two keystrokes. Screen width? We have 4K monitors now, not 80 character terminals. Now look at this transformation on screen. Movie 1 and Movie 2 instead of M1 and M2. Genre weight instead of GW. Movies on page instead of MOV on PG. Every name becomes self-documenting. The code reads like prose, not a cipher. Okay, let's move on. Tip three, don't put types in your variable names. Look at these variables on screen. B is valid, I, speed, U, num, users, S, Z, username. Notice the prefixes, B for Boolean, I for integer, S, Z for string. This practice is called Hungarian notation, and it made sense in early C programming when type information wasn't readily available. But modern languages with strong type systems make this redundant. Your IDE already shows you the type on hover. The compiler catches type mismatches. Now watch what happens when you refactor. That integer i speed becomes a float, but the name still says i. The type prefix lies to you. Adding type prefixes just creates noise that obscures the actual meaning. Let the type system handle types. Let your names describe purpose and meaning. Tip four. This one reverses the previous tip. Do put units in your variable names. Here's a function on screen. Execute takes an integer called delay. Simple enough. But wait, what unit is that delay? Milliseconds? Seconds? Minutes? You're looking at a real bug waiting to happen. Developers pass five thinking five seconds. The function expects milliseconds. Suddenly, your timeout is a thousand times too long. Now look at the fix. Delay seconds. Or even better, use a type that encodes the unit, like time span or duration. The type itself becomes self-documenting. You cannot accidentally pass milliseconds where seconds are expected because the type system prevents it. This is one of the few places where embedding information in the name adds clarity. Types tell you what something is. Units tell you how to use it. Tip five. Don't prefix interfaces with I. Here's a typical interface on screen. I file saver. That capital I at the start tells you this is an interface. But here's the question, should you care? This is contentious because it's deeply embedded in C-sharp convention. But think about what that I prefix actually communicates. It tells consumers they're working with an interface rather than a class. But consumers shouldn't care. That's the entire point of interfaces. Whether something is an interface, abstract class, or concrete class is an implementation detail. Now look at this code full of I prefixes. I user service, I auth provider, I logger, I database. It's visual noise. The I adds nothing meaningful. 
Just name it what it does. File saver, not I file saver. Movable, not I movable. Let implementation details stay hidden where they belong. Tip six, don't name your classes with base or abstract. Look at this class hierarchy on screen. Base truck at the top, truck below it. Seems logical, right? Actually, it's backwards. The base class is the general concept. It should get the clean name. The derived class is the specialization. It should describe what makes it special. Now watch the transformation. Instead of base truck with child truck, we use truck as the base with trailer truck as the specialization. See how this scales? Truck can have semi-truck, pickup truck, delivery truck as children. Each name describes the specific variation, not its position in the hierarchy. The word base tells you nothing about what the class does. The word trailer tells you everything. Make your inheritance hierarchies read like a taxonomy, not like a folder structure. Tip seven, avoid utils and helper classes. Look at this utils file on screen. Assign defaults, relation score, movies on page, top movies by rating, parse cookie, assign cookie. What do these functions have in common? Nothing, that's the problem. When you create a file called utils, you're admitting you don't know where this code belongs. Utils becomes a junk drawer, random functions thrown together because they didn't fit anywhere else. But each function has a proper home. Watch as we refactor. That relation score function, it belongs on the movie class. That pagination logic, it belongs in a pager class. That cookie parsing, it belongs in a cookie class. For each function in utils, ask, what noun does this operate on? That noun becomes the class. When you eliminate utils, your architecture becomes clearer, your imports become focused, and that junk drawer disappears. Let's recap the seven patterns. Don't use single letter variables outside of simple loops. Never abbreviate names. Autocomplete makes long names free. Don't put types in variable names. Let the type system handle that. Do put units in names when the type doesn't encode them. Don't prefix interfaces with I, it's implementation noise. Don't name classes base or abstract. Give the clean name to the parent. And avoid utils classes. Find proper homes for orphaned functions. These patterns share one principle. Names should communicate intent, not implementation. When you read well-named code, you understand what it does without tracing definitions. That's the goal. Your code should read like well-written prose. These seven patterns are your editing checklist. Apply them consistently and watch your code base transform from a puzzle into a story.